Let's start with prayer. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the regular the Holy Eucharist. Thank you for this time of conversation and thought upon this great mystery of radio. Help us understand more fully your love for us, who you truly are, what the Eucharist is, and close to it, not just simply in our minds, but in our hearts and our actions. We entrust this time, this conversation, to the hands of our mother as we say. Saying is, I am in heaven. In other words, I am going to be walking with my people 
feeding them, nourishing them, bringing them to the union of life and covenant. So this context of being called himself the man of heaven, the bread of heaven, who feeding his people, is just a random analogy. It's very deliberately planned by God. God's smart. You <laughs> quote. <laughs> um, and so God is very deliberately saying, think back to what was natural, think back to what I did. And it's meant to be revelational when you're doing that now. Because every day, every Sunday, we, we are fed. We are fed the bread of heaven, which walks them. Uh, the man in the desert was what kept them nourished and alive and able to move forward, able to go toward Israel, become God's people. This spread, the truth of the power of heaven, that's us, go forward and walk and become God's people in a whole new way. Right? And so when the Lord says, oh, this is the bread of heaven, what he's saying is, new Exodus, new Moses, new covenant, new life. And the Jews will move God. This is why they this is why they leave. It's because it's the shock. And more than that, he says, those who eat this bread will not die. And this bread is so full of life. This bread is so full of, of, of creation. But those who eat of this will not die. Where have we heard in the Old Testament another thing that, that we eat that we will not die? <laughs> not the apple. The apple killed them, right? <laughs> but they're close. They're close. Close. Not the apple. The tree of life. Tree of life. Right? There, there were two trees yeah. in the garden. Yes. There was there the apple, the tree of knowledge and evil, the cane, or the right again, and the tree of life. The tree of life, they would have eaten. But right, so you can't eat of this tree because you're eating the blood forever. So now you have the healing of the garden, the tree of life, which is then connected to the tree of the cross. You'll see. So the, the true tree of life is the cross. The fruit of that tree is you, Christ Himself. So the living bread of heaven to find for life, to feed you, to walk you in the journey, to bring you forward. That's the that's the talking about. Um, the, the whole thing is, is, is so chock full of things to <clears throat> think and ponder and meditate upon is beyond what God's present doing. And more than that, one more thing to point out here too, is Christ gives life by his death. And so right, you have here in this phrase, it talks about those who will die, uh, the life flesh and life of the world. He's saying we're going to die. My flesh will be given up in life of the world. It's not just an offer. I'm going to die to give you life. He'll eat of this death. So we have to die and get life. We have to die to ourselves and die to sin. There's also a revelation of the crucifixion. Yeah. But yes, we imitate Christ, absolutely. Um, but so we have here in that phrase, he's saying is the Eucharist and the crucifixion are the same thing. Which is incredible. I think we'll talk about it further on in the chapter. Well, just kind of as a these couple of verses. Jesus sums up the teaching of the Eucharist which he gave to the people who would come to the pearl. After the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. His work on this occasion shocked the listeners. But we usually see Jesus and souls around him with word of acts of mercy. Here he intentionally speaks in terms of the man that confused and scandalized. Why? Why is he scandalized? Why is he, why is he being this way? Why not be more gentle? Why not say, why not put that? So, so that's why they're scandalized. Why is Christ being scandalous? I mean, it's not that, but why is he speaking in this way? Why is he speaking in these harsh terms? And normally, when people are confused, he's going to gentle or talk to them. Here he's not. Here he's saying, This is late. Like or not. Do you want to confuse them or give them false 
ideas. Well, you have false information. Um, in that same passage, this isn't the, the word to use to, to eat like a non inconvenience, very yeah. visceral. It's not, not, not spiritually, this is, this is part of pizza. This is food, this is bread, you have to eat this, you have to drink my blood. There's a lot. These aren't insult, these aren't like comforting words, they're just confusing words. But he speaks it as necessary. Because look, the gift being offered, Christ sees as necessary and important, even though everyone will accept it. Christ is willing to scandalize and to shock for the sake of giving something really important. We look at the cross, and for us, the cross is soul. And that's good. So, what I'm saying is, I'm commenting on the words here of the bishop. Where he says the words of Christ, this page are consoled. And often we hear this, these words as consoled, kind of pass over. And what I'm saying is, is that the bishop's saying, and I'm saying, uh, the fact that he's not being consoled, there's a reason behind it. The Lord could have spoken gently. But he wants us to be waking up. And we live in a time where we're so used to some of these things, we don't ever see how startling these things are. And so even the cross, to us, we look back and say, well, that's consoling. And that's good, it should be consoling. We all have to recognize the cross is not a pretty thing. Right? The, the cross should be a shocking thing. Not in the sense of horror or disgust, but in the sense of awe and wonder. In the sense of something happening here with which we should be incredibly amazed, gratified, astounded, that God became man and died for us. That the cross should be an ordinary thing for us. But yet God, God, God came and died for us. Okay. So God came and died for us. <laughs> this should be shocking. This should be. And God became a die for us, and God used that death fears. God grabbed his life to us to walk with us to make us live. So we can live with God and walk with God and like, that should be shocking. That should be a sad. It should be something that we don't pass over or think is irrelevant or unimportant. It should be something that inflames us, inspires us, burns on us. It's the great truth. As the Lord is, is being is emphasizing these words, is saying, first of all, I'm going to compromise. But he's also saying, this is so important, you should be woken up by this. You can either wake up and reject it, wake up and be refreshed, astonished, and gratified. Honestly, God is always, at the direction of God with us idiots, should be shocking, gratifying, and <laughs> all We don't, don't think, well, of course God is going to talk to me. You know, of course God would come and give you the law of God. Of course God would come and come. No. This is God. And he loves us, walks with us, and saves us. And this should be awe-inspiring and humbling and glorious and beautiful and incredible. All at the same time. It's a Christ whose language that is shocking and blunt because he's trying to wake us up, trying to get us to see. What's happening is incredible and is furious and wonderful and beautiful. And don't pass over. He just said, Yeah, you know, I'll feed you the care of you. Okay. Whatever. No, this is, this is bread. This is my flesh. This is my blood. You have to eat this or you're going to die. This, 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 this is an urgent thing. But Christ is very literally being blunt and shocking to wake us up and have us be inspired and flame. That's why. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. In, in this case, yes, I am. But absolutely, there there is a difference. But in this, as I was saying, I meant crucifixion and Calvary. And, uh, why don't you Yeah. I don't know if that was just human blood or potato head 
from Greg too. <clears throat> Any one. Yeah. For the book of the Vedas. Yes. Because you, that's always the side. So there's two different kinds of unclean. There is the uncleanness of sin, and there is the uncleanness of uh, ritual. There is the uncleanness uh, of something that is set aside, used it the wrong way. So blood is unclean, not in the sense of sin, but in the sense of a rod or dirt. And it belongs to God. To the Jewish people, this is Leviticus chapter 19, 17, blood is life. And so blood was not part of God. Only God had rights over blood. Every part of the blood belonged to God. Because that was life. So when the sacrifice is, the blood is set aside the part. This was so, so important and so precious, the Jews got eat it. Right? They, 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 uh, kosher beef, you know, probably about the taste the way it does, it's because all the blood's right. There's no blood. Because blood belongs to God. The Jews can't. And then to emphasize this for contact, because that belongs to God. But now that God has become man, and this is what probably might be shocking, what God is saying is, I'm going to give you life. You're going to partake of something that belongs to God to receive life that is divine. Right? Because Christ's blood is divine. Divine. So, so, so even if you were to say, I'm going to give you the blood, the blood of the bulls, you'll get waited there. Hold it. That belongs to God. So there is a deeper union, a, a deeper depth of union, and a, a deeper purification, healing, and life giving. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the implications of that are, are shocking and profound, glorious and astounding. <laughs> so, back in verse 17. The usually see Jesus and soul is around him, the word of actual mercy. Very intentionally speaks in church, he makes a few scandal. They can speak of cannibals or disgusting. They understand the way in which he leaves his flesh to eat. They misunderstand the way he would leave his flesh to eat under forms of bread and water. Jesus did not water down his teaching in the moment, however. Rather, he emphasized it let's sweep the flesh of a man, drink his blood, have a life. He even allowed many of the listeners to walk the way they were able to accept his words. It shows the importance he placed in the central reality of the faith. Why does Christ come to us under the appearance of the bread and water? Several reasons. But what, why does he look, why under the appearances of forms, species, Ways to see Why under the appearance of bread and water? Why is it gross? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So he's, he's showing us, so it's gross, if not, if it, was, if it was under the ordinary blood and flesh, it's kind of gross, nasty. Um, he's showing his food. Absolutely, and, 
And so here, if it was the literal, or not literal, but they, that's not the book. If it was under the appearance of the ordinary uh, flesh and blood, we get a piece, not the whole. So when you receive communion, are you receiving a piece of Jesus? Receiving the whole Jesus, right? Body, blood, soul, and it. Out of the smallest drop of the blood, the smallest, smallest part of the whole host. Only possible because of the sacrament. Not possible if it were just you know, chopped up in those fingers. The right. And so you see the whole thing around the piece. Um, and so that, that also that means is that living. If you receive a cup of blood, is that living? Is, 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 is it, if I were to open my bag and pour some blood in the cup for you, you drink it, is that blood alive? alive? Yes. I mean, the, 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 you say the blood is not good wine, depending on how fresh it is. It's my source, though, right? Well, more than that, did you see the whole Jesus? No, I'm coming back here. Oh, <laughs> no. my blood. You just said, yes. if I cut my wrist and poured it in the cup, yeah. so it's it your life source. It would be my life source, and it would, uh, that's not living. That's my point. So the reason why my Christ comes to us in this way, as opposed to opening up his veins, we did that too, so they go drink his veins, cut them the appearance of red wine. But he mm-hmm. had the power to change to change the fish and the loaves of bread he into bread, so he would also have the power to change his blood into he his spiritual life. But he did it. So he did it this way. He, he, has, he has received him literally, truly, out of the appearance of bread and wine. But it has to be transformed. The bread and wine has to be transformed. Correct. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise, it's just bread and wine and not truly him. Yeah. Yes. But let's, so why this way? But why not just multiply his blood and pass around cups of blood or hunks of flesh? Because we're not. So we're, there's a big given the reason. Yes. First of all, because it, it would promise out. Yeah. Secondly, because emphasize is real food. So you have so he's shown us what he's doing to our souls. Third of all, because a hunk of flesh doesn't contain the whole. Okay. Fourth of all, because it's not a living thing or a living person. And so we're receiving, when we receive Christ whole, if I give you my finger or cut my blood, it's not me in person. This is a, a living God, not a piece of dead flesh. At cannibalism, you're receiving a dead body. Communion, you're receiving the fullness of a living God. If it were not on the appearance of red wine, communion, these wouldn't be possible. Wouldn't have the emphasis of the food being manna being life. Wouldn't have wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't only see a piece of our whole and wouldn't be living. And so, we, so we, by doing it this way, besides I'm not throwing this out, there's really profound things happening that are only possible because of, of the Eucharist, because of the sacrament, because, because of this transformation. The comment to us the of bread and wine is an afterthought. It's not something he said, you know, this. All, all things easy for you guys, I'm glad you did. But it's also for the sake of this stuff. We perceive completely and fully perceive the life and living. He lives in us. That makes us alive. So, so this fact is really, really important. And beautiful and sad. I I should share with you four of things memorized and all of you that. I get it, I should have. That's on me. Please. Yeah. Uh, I think that how people used to work in the fields and grow their wheat and all, or grow their fruits, and they would actually offer this up. I'm sure. Would they bring that forward as gifts? Just like that song. You mean you mean in Christian times? Yeah. As, as opposed to Jewish times? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so people would, would come forward and they would bring their labor, their work, their effort. Um, in the Jewish times, it was the first fruit. Um, right? Nowadays, we substitute, we give our sweat and blood 
money, which represents all that stuff. It's representative of, of your sweat, your labor, your work. Uh, you give it to God very literally. It's then purchases lights and bread and wine and everything else. So yeah, absolutely. You, you, when you got money in the basket, it's not just because Father was greedy and wants money. It might be true too. But it's because you are sharing the sacrifice in a literal way. Your sweat, your work, your efforts to go in big part of that sacrifice. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Article 18. Now, there's 20 minutes in one. We're going to move. From that day to this, the church has seen many occasions of confusion and misunderstanding when it comes to the Eucharist. One example of this came shortly after the Second Advent Council. Pope St. Paul VI foresaw there were some who, in an effort to the liturgy and understanding of the, of the sacrament, were in danger of misrepresenting Christ's teaching of the Eucharist. To avoid this, he wrote a simple letter called the Steering of Beauty, this is a good thing. In this letter, we are first the Eucharist, in the first place, the mystery. I guess the Eucharist. I'm sorry, I anticipated my apologies. Now, a mystery for Christian is not referred to something you cannot know. Rather, something you seek to know out more. The depth of which goes far beyond what we understand with our senses and like love. This is something that only eliminated by faith. So he talks about Christ and very specifically for the Eucharist, and one of his hands, kind of an error. As faith supplied the defect of the senses. The implication of this that our human language will always fall short to try to describe what's happening. What is faith? Believe in something that we can't see. Believe in the same. Mm. Could be. Could be. Um, <clears throat> but more than that. Truth revealed by God. So you're believing in not just something, you're believing in someone. If I have faith, I'm trusting the words of somebody in us. So yeah, I don't see it, I can't prove I can't hold it. I might be able to prove it in some ways, but not necessarily this way I love it things. Um, it's, it's, it's beyond my grasp. But I'm believing I'm trusting somebody's word. So you tell me to get to your house, I haven't been to your house. That's not reasonable, it's not just wishful thinking, it's not just hoping, it's not just um, closing my eyes and jumping. It's, I trust you. Or, you know, somebody who is a, who works with a strong, they tell me, he tells me that, you know, there's going to be an eclipse of the sun, you know, you know, one eclipse of the sun on this day. I have faith in his words, but we know that it was the potential of that. So faith is believing somewhat. So, it's, so like all too often, we focus on the fact that we don't see it. It ends up kind of, we think of this, this faith is simply wishful thinking, it's hope things, closing your eyes and guessing. Faith is not uncertain. Faith is more certain. Than any other form of knowledge. How do I say that? What about that match? What about seeing the sun? What about how can I say that faith is more certain than any other kind of knowledge? Because of where the knowledge comes from. Because of where the knowledge comes from. And where does knowledge come from? From God. From God. God. And God kind of lied to us. Because that would be sin. He can't sin. And nor can I make mistakes. 
Right? If I do math, it's what? I can make a mistake. That's for me. If I observe something, guess what? My eyes can do the seat. I can, I, I can make an error of what I'm seeing. I can have bad vision, I can be drunk, I can be blinded by the sun, I can make mistakes. Who of us hasn't made mistakes? I think we saw something, remembered something, heard something, and didn't hear or see it, or remember it right. Right? Every other kind of knowledge relies upon me or upon somebody else. If I can trust the doctor so and so, and think, well, that's worthy of trust, this is far more certain. If I can trust my thinking and say, well, I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, surely I can trust God's thinking. This is far more certain than the former knowledge. And so you have to don't see it, but it's not uncertain. It is worthy of belief, more than worthy of belief, it's absolutely worthy of belief. More than that, faith is a kind of contact with God. Contact. This is why faith is prolific. Faith upstairs. And the end's God who saves us, not this. It's got contact with God. We're, we're sharing with something of God. See, we share in God's knowledge. We have a share in what God sees and knows and understands. And so if you look at, at the church fathers of the saints, the twelve of them think of uh, uh, faith as us kind of gritting our teeth, holding on, in spite of everything. Look what the saints say. You know, faith has got to come into a talk and saying, I'm going to be with you, hold fast to and be close to And now I have something sure and certain beyond me. It's contact with Christ comes. So faith is sharing in the knowledge of Christ, who is God. Because we share the knowledge of Christ, makes us more like God, and then it helps save us. That we also we need to play practice, we need to live charity, we need to get some other things which add to that, obviously. The devils believe in that we look. Uh, but faith is a contact. Faith is a union with God. Um, and faith is certain and sure because of where it comes from. We share in the knowledge of Jesus. So when I Talk about that. I think about Paul's letter to the Hebrews, where he's talking about faith and believing in believing in seeing. That's kind of what that. Yeah. About right there. Yeah, absolutely. So it's unseen, but it's not uncertain. Right? And that's an important distinction. I can't see my heart right now. I have never opened up my chest and seen my heart. If you have, good on you. <laughs> I have. But I don't doubt that I have a heart. You might, you might doubt that. Oh. You might say I have a heart, but I don't, I don't doubt that I, 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 have, I, have, I have a heart. I have no doubt that I have a brain. I have no doubt that. <laughs> so unseen, does not mean uncertain. And I think, uh, unfortunately, we live in a world that says faith means uncertain. Unseen means uncertain. But that there are deeper sources of knowledge and trust. Ultimately, this rely upon God. And, and so because of that, this is why it's a divine gift, a divine, a divine union. And this is why we call it mystery of faith, because it's not in contact with God. You don't see Him. You don't see Jesus Christ physically. He's visibly there. No, he's there. Unseen, not uncertain. And so it nourishes our soul, our heart. We're closer to him. We could be if you were standing there all six feet of him. Right? If you're six feet of him, we would see him in our hearts and our bodies. We eat him. No. <laughs> right? If he came down from heaven right now in front of us, we'd go, yes, eat him now. <laughs> you can going really to do it. So because he comes to us whole and entire under the close, you can receive entirely into your body. You are closer to him, you're deeper contact with him, so unseen, but not uncertain. 
And so faith, yes, is that it's unseen, but it's more certain. And I think this is really, really important. It's really long term. Because people look at faith and hope, and think that we're just kind of guessing and hoping and wishing and crossing our fingers. That's not that's not it's kind of faith. That's not the faith of the saints talk. We have to doubt. I wonder if you're wondering, well, what if I'm wrong? You could be wrong. Christ is. Christ sees it. Mm-hmm. What was that? You, th- you could be thinking that you're in contact with God or Christ when you're really in contact with the evil spirit. And that's true, and that's why we have a church. Because we, the truth doesn't change. Right, so Hebrews chapter 13. Christ yesterday, today, and forever. Um, so that if you hold fast to teach you, you can talk. So the truth isn't going to change. Galatians chapter 1. If you have not entered from heaven, to a different gospel, let them be cursed. You belong to hell. Right? If I come to tomorrow and I say to you guys, I'm an idiot, technically, actually, that's just a symbol, and Jesus is only God. Well, don't say, well, Father, know what he's doing. Take me out. I'm say, you're probably wrong. That's heresy. So your faith is a lie upon me, a lies upon God. And, and, we, and because we have an unchanging condition, an unchanging proof, we, we can measure, measure in a way and say, my faith is, isn't the measure. God is mine. My faith is holding fast to God. Those are real thoughts of talk to us. An evil spirit is not going to come to you and teach you how to pray. It's not going to come to you and teach you the mysteries of the truth. So, He's going to confuse it. And then he does. So, if you're going to the same truth of the apostles, preached preach among the Gentiles, died for by the saints, well, then it's not from the dead. But absolutely, sitting, sitting in prayer, I wish we're coming here and saying, This is Jesus speaking. Definitely question that first. You could absolutely be saved. Or, or if someone comes to us and says, Well, I have been on that faith, and now I know what God really wants. It's not this. Well, what does what Christ say? Christ, God doesn't change the law, God doesn't change. It's all going to be But yes, so, because we don't see it, trying to describe this mystery of faith in the Eucharist, there's always been more. We're trying to describe Jesus, trying to just talk about who Jesus is. There's always more to that. Doesn't Jesus tell us if someone's a false prophet? We, if we are in doubt, we can verify it in the Bible and his word. The Bible is word and tradition and. Right. Yeah. So if you're in doubt, read the Bible and yeah. check it out. Right. Absolutely. The Bible, the catechism. First Father say, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You say no Mary or yes. Oh, I was, yeah, they might be Because there's a lot of things I've been noticing on YouTube, there's a lot of stuff that is not true. Well, I think that's true. Not Christian. <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> Anybody can be on YouTube though. YouTube or Wikipedia or throw a book. Yeah. I don't do that other stuff, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah. The thing about the, let's back up a second. Sure. Uh, to the Mysterium Fidei Valet. Okay. And the purpose of him writing it was to help, after Vatican II, to help clarify. Now, at the time that came out, I wasn't old enough to really remember. But what was, do you think it cleared that? Yeah, in that case, younger dad. Yeah, you took my thing. Yeah. <laughs> so the question I got is, okay, prior to that, I had the Latin Mass. Mm-hmm. Was are you aware of or anything? Was there even that confusion in the Eucharist prior to Vatican II, or do you think Vatican II helped feed that confusion as far as the sixty-six percent of people believe it's symbolic as opposed to? Uh, so what I would say is that unfortunately. As long as human beings are going to be confused in that. 
Um, and so there were, in the past have many parents that sprung up. That being said, the culture and the way faith was taught after Vatican II, I don't want to necessarily say Vatican II's fault necessarily. Um, what was the question? Well, but at least, at least the after effects, the way it was taught, the culture around it, the way that people passed on, absolutely. The difficulty we have now is that error is being taught as true. Um, and confusing things are being taught in bad, bad ways. Um, it's happened in the past before, yes, but we're seeing it once again in a way that it is very widespread, is it being condemned the way it should. Um, and it's also a resurgence of error as opposed to a new error. So often in the past, when things are being taught or clarified, it's because there were new errors. And there was confusion. The problem with today's errors, the old errors, it's not new invention, it's not a new question. It's old errors have already been answered. They're still being taught as those are I guess, I guess where, please, yeah. the, so with him writing this letter, trying to help clarify mm -hmm. us, and yet we're still at 66% of you, with that letter, do you think it been successful, or do you think it was improperly communicated or passed out through the generations since Vatican II? No, I absolutely think it was more. Absolutely. Um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of things, it looks mad at detail. Um, no one met the meeting was right, but I'll be better off on reception saying it's forbidden. The speed rating is all at the top. Those of you who were around at the time know what happened. It wasn't taught, or it was taught, and it was said, the Pope's wrong on this. The Pope were glad I had a lot of lies going around, so the Pope changed the mind. Or it was, this is an important thing, and you can do whatever you want. Or it was, the Pope made a mistake, and you know, it's not that they need. Um, in this diocese, the letter, the letter came out, I've been told by some of the other priests that they know, they know there were priests in the diocese literally got all the copies of letters that were totally passed out and destroyed them. They weren't distributed to our diocese. Um, so after that happened, um, over in, in D.C., most of the theology faculty at Catholic University signed a petition saying the Pope's wrong. They published a public statement saying everything's never, it's a mistake here, the Pope's this, this is all old man who's made a mistake. He made good Catholic words. So the problem wasn't in the teaching, the problem was that there were a bunch of rebel, rebels who passed on lives. So that was the truth. Uh, in other words, it shouldn't be so much that the Pope miscommunicated his intention as much as it just wasn't properly passed down. In this case, yes. Yeah. When he was trying to be passed down. Yeah. In this case, yeah. Uh, but. And at least for myself, I can say that I have not read very many letters or encyclicals around the lifetime. So yeah. Even if they are all there sometimes. Yeah, they're all there these days. <laughs> That's why I didn't know the answer to your first question. And they didn't bring it up in our CIA. <laughs> I mean, and again, there's so much you could bring up, you have to put the time. Um, but I, I think we live in a culture now, I think it's, start, it's turning in some ways, but there was for a long time a culture where people figured there was kind of a, a very strange false optimism uh, where people figured that everybody would always want to be on their own. Everyone always had a good foundation for things. And so they could focus on relationship stuff and not pass on. And so, so in Catholic class, you can hear, I can hear, you know, when the, the confession class came, rather than teaching sin and sin and repentance and the confession, taught was Christ loves you and you're a lost sheep and Christ will find you. That's not bad. If you know what sin is, you don't know what confession, you don't know what repentance is. You know, you're missing everything. The fact that Christ loves you is important to know. It's incomplete. Yeah. And all you have is, is the one part, you're not going to stick up to the faith. You're going to say, well, it's, well, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about sin. So Christ loves me. And half the truth is a lie. Um, 
you know, so I, I mean, I, I think what happened in many cases was the, 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 the part from Madison, the part from Sip, there was that too. But, but I think you had this, this false optimism where people assumed the foundation would change and they were just going to be adding to it and pleading. And what happened was instead, where they substituted the, the good foundation for this stuff that meant to be kind of ancillary and pack, like pack material, and that became a foundation in a lot of So that people don't know the basic. You're um, the exception. Is it true that we didn't start allowing receiving on the hand until after that in the Yes. That works for Latin maps before that everybody received? That's correct. Yeah. Um, so, one of the Confusions, lies, part malice, part not malice, depending on the person involved, that's complicated. Um, was there was a desire to get rid of what they called the medieval accretions, to get rid of, rid of the, to go back to the pure form of those. In the early church, people had received from that. That's true, but. How they receive, when they receive, the way one receives is very, very different what happens now. Um, hold the question. So in 1970, that's 1969, the Pope allowed the first time for second period of the hands to the fourth center. Um, it was forbidden after the fourth center. No one received the hand after. And so they said, so again, the optimism was, we went with the Catholic on that, was People love the Lord, they're going to receive the reference and love, they go over to him, they this is reverent, and they're going to know who he's close to them, rather than they don't understand who they're receiving. And it becomes kind of, um, or can become, I'm not judging the person, but it, it easily becomes something unimportant and irrelevant. Um, if there's just one more thing to get. When I watched Mass last week on TV, the one thing I did notice, it was a beautiful, beautiful mass. And but when people came up for communion, there was so much confusion. Because one person would receive in their mouth, the next person would be and the next person would receive in their hands. And it was like you're watching watch this beautiful mass and then, and during communion it was like you know, like pick kind of pop and, and the poor priest I felt so sorry for him because it was like up, down, around. It, it, it was kind of, it just showed how much confusion there is in our church right now. Yes. And, and everyone was doing what they thought was right mm -hmm. and everything, but it was chaotic. Yes. And it took this beautiful mass and made it into a, a part of that was chaos. Yeah. And so that's what I miss about the Latin mass. The Latin mass is. And also the places where they don't have a communion at all. In the bigger churches, that I've taken your hand and I prefer to. But, you know, it's just such a large group of people who have a community of and it kind of dilutes the need. It does. It does. So I think that I'll go back. <laughs> well, and, and so this is not, I'm going to give you my opinion, so take as much soul as you want. This is not the thing, this is my opinion. So, two things that I think are problematic. So, this is one reason why I actually think the rail is of great importance. Because it, it solves many of the problems. Um, the only is, is it. Unfortunately, when you have a, 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 a conveyor belt line, you end up taking guys to pray be quick. With a communion rail, you can stop, you can pause, you can come up and pray for an elders. You can put folks on your door. For the priest, the person in front of you is not moving. Mm -hmm. You know, it's actually safe and reverent. It's not worried that you walk down and just come forward. You don't, you don't come up with my face, you're not going to be way over there. Yeah. You know exactly what you're saying. But the communion rail also makes you be humble before Christ. Um, there's many, many reasons for it. The other thing I get, my opinion, you can continue to disagree with this if you want to. My opinion, one of the problems we have in the church today 
There's so many options. Um, and so you're going to find priests all being perfect in the rubrics, all being the reverence they can, all trying to serve of God at five rest. And the problem is that what, what the impression is given is that none of this matters. But where there's an option, what you're saying is these are equally the same. You had to be easily thinking that, that there's no right or wrong. Everything's okay, everything's the same. Everything's equal. And you end up then, often very quickly become then my preference. Right? If I have three options, I well, think which one I think is best. And very quickly becomes then be focused. So it confuses truth and ends up being focused upon well, what do we think is best then? So it, my opinion is that this is a, a great cancer um, with too many options. Um, now at this point, I think nothing about it. <laughs> right. And I'm not going to tell people you can't do things that you're wrong to do with your sinful to do with it, the author of them. Um, but I absolutely do think that it has led to many problems. And I think another part of it is just the amount of travel uh, that people have the option of doing. So we are going to church in different towns and that may have slightly different masses as far as the structure of what they do during certain parts of the mass. Uh, you don't try to write that, but we're avoiding, you can avoid the question of people doing the wrong thing. Yeah. And, and I think even a hundred years ago, people didn't travel as much. Even towns that were only 10 miles apart, they had separate churches. Everyone went to their church, there's no reason to do it. But if they did, it's the exact same. Um, now, some of us may have gone too far. That, that's, I think I know that's true. But you actually had the seminaries who, who practice, and I used to put your hands apart. Literally, you would have a string that would say, we're four minutes. That's what they do. Uh, and so every mass, the exact same gesture, the exact same time, the exact same. Now, there's little differences this way. Some of them talk faster or louder or something. But gestures are the same, most of the same, and was the same. Uh, so you go to Poland or China or England or France or America, and the exact same act, the exact same gesture, the exact same. same thing. So, that has not been my experience. <laughs> right. Yeah. In my life. yeah, no. <laughs> not since I said it. Oh, that's not 64 actually, that was the sort of change. Prior to that, was it just one Eucharistic prayer? Yes. Um, at least for the last 600 years, yes. Uh, there were, middle ages there were more, but yeah, all, all the ones that we have uh, were added to this sort that were new since the, since the 12th or second. We're coming to communion to church. Yeah. Um, we're standing on holy ground at that point. Yep. And when Moses went to the burning bush and God told him, You're on holy ground, remove your shoes. If we truly believe that this is going up and receiving Christ and seeing Christ face to face, wouldn't we be crawling on our knees to get there? Some people do. Well, I know, but I mean, you know, I mean yeah. there are your options are. Of walking up well, and you yeah. know and, and coming up and your communion rail as you say uh, kneeling down and showing reverence to the Lord that's coming to him. Absolutely. I mean, that's where so many people don't believe that that's what they're actually doing, and that's where yeah. uh, David was saying, you know, that 66 percent of people don't really believe it because they're not humble enough to say, "I'm in the presence of God." But I think that a lot of people do believe that what they're doing is that they were never taught. Yes, yes that's also awesome. They were never taught what they should do or what the meaning was. And so being a convert when I first came, that's what I was taught. And I thought I was being humble and I thought I was doing all the right things. It wasn't until I saw someone else, when everybody else was like, they went ahead it was that they knelt down, and that person inspired me to find out what it was about. But it was never taught, 
And so those people, I don't think that I, I would feel like they're not being as, in their minds, they're doing what they think they were, they were taught they were supposed to do, and they feel like they were being humble. But it wasn't until you saw something else that you realized that there was more. Well, and I go a step further than that, because I think in some cases they were taught Neil is a best I think in some cases people were taught Korean rail is actually a best See, I never knew that. Oh, I yeah, yeah, it's 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 like it. keeping. In, in some places, people were taught uh, the community rail was a offense to God and was keeping you from God. Well, we He and I are very, very talented. Um, I can't spend more time about that at all. Um, it's as far as I go. Christine, what about that? I lick my lips as far as I go. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there, there is a extra little flap of skin which keeps me locked up. Um, can't roll my arms because of that. Can't roll my arms. Um, but because of that, when that first converted, he was worried about the post God. He was using the hands as a way to post falling on the floor. Now, he's changed recently by the last for a few years. The first few years, he was using the palm of the hand because he was afraid of the post God. So there may be good reasons. Um, so what I just tell people when they ask me that I say, look within your heart. You know what the truth is. Make your intention to honor and love the Lord the best you can. If you're doing that, it's going to be okay. If you're, do, if you're receiving up on the tongue, kneeling to the shoulder, how, how great you are, how terrible they are, you're doing the wrong thing. Right? If, you're, if they're kneeling to people who admire you and love you, and, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're standing, you say, this guy, I believe that's the wrong thing. And you receive on the tongue standing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, what I would say, if you have a problem with kneeling, stand and be at peace. Um, but whether you're standing or kneeling, do show a love for God. And I raise it for God and say, this is something to give you the best I can. I, I, I know that there's a communion. Sure. Yeah. But the Lord knows what's in it. Yeah. And, 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 and honestly, there are people here who can't can. And I don't, I, I know they would kneel if they could. Um, and same thing's true about the kneeler. Um, you know. If you can't do it, don't. Kill yourself and be stuck there in a mess. I'm going to back up real quick on the sure. talking about the communion rail where people talk, that's the fence uh, before you step on the holy ground. I'm not going there. So, so that was a modern lie. It was never a traditional teaching. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I've seen photos and I think I've even, in fact, I was in the military, I think I even went to a cathedral. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like a, I want to say a tertiary, where it's like a lattice around, mm -hmm. a lattice fence around. Right, a screen or a... Yeah, and only the priest goes in, does the gas, everybody else comes out. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what's that called? I can't remember. That's what I'm trying to So, if you go to England or some of the old German churches, they are called a root screen. Not R-U-D, not R-O-O-D. Rude is an old English word for cross. 
the last word you see in some of the ordinary churches is the root screen, or some of the older churches the root screen. Um, in the east, have the iconostasis. Um, same meaning, same point. Um, same, same, this is a screen with the icon, the icon screen for it. It is like a, kind of like a wall that's, that separates sanctuary from the name. Uh, it's like a lattice. Yeah, it, depending on it. Yeah. So some of them are less than that, yes. Some of them are lattices, some of them you just kind of have um, the, the railing down here, and you have kind of like this arches up a high. Um, if we had a taller ceiling, I would put something <laughs> above the ceiling. We don't. We get it. Um, Your sense is like something. Uh, no, it's, it's not it's a question of, I don't have a feel, it's just a matter of our feet are so low. Anything up in the ceiling would get in the way and it would look fine. We're just easy. No, I thought it was Don't worry. It may come to you yet. It may. Um, but the reason why is there's a couple reasons. I mean, it is the vision. It is saying there's something holy. Uh, but also, it is a place where you're marking when you're seeking. You're marking the contact of God or the of man or the man of God, God, heaven and earth. Um, you're making it special and beautiful and sacred. Um, over in Bethlehem, where Christ was born, they took the place of angel they put it as silver star there. Because the communion rail is this meeting place of heaven and earth. And it's really beautiful and glorious and awe inspiring and awesome. <laughs> awesome and astounding. Um, but yeah. Um, but I thought people in this parish, uh, when I first heard about the idea, who told me that, that they were told that it was meant to, to be a fat saying, You're not worthy to be here. I'm better than you are, I have bad effects, and you're not enough. And if that's what you're taught, you know, if, 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 if yeah, the father so and so needs to do that thing, of course you're going to be, be wondering why you have not going to receive the other one. So, I mean, yeah, I don't blame p individual people, I, I do blame the Institutions that might blame for some of the options that cause me. My opinion. Uh, but again, the face with options, do your best to put the most reverence, love, and honor you can do. Cool. Seven o'clock, we got the two verses of an hour. <laughs> Let's go at least one more. <laughs> what was that? 19. 19. We could go at least with Christ, but was, this is fun. I'm having fun. Good. Over the centuries of life, as she has sought to understand the full meaning of the faith, First, when able to express the truth of the Eucharist in a clear and consistent way. It's important to review this teaching regularly through understanding of it often. Most we can stay in the fullness of the truth of Christ and continually go deeper in the depth of sacred mystery. In other words, never think you've done enough. Never think I know enough. I'm finished learning. I'm finished. And I have to really go back. In this part of the present exhortation, I will seek to lead us in such an exercise of faith by examining four main areas of the teaching of the Eucharist sacrifice, food nourishment, sacrifice of Christ's presence, and holy communion. So these are the next articles of this section. I'll go through these four teachings. I'm trying to figure out where to stop. 
Can we move forward? But I think we'll get stuck. Um, huh. It's a good place to stop. Let me ask you, because you're the one that's listening to me. So I'm happy to say, you're all listening to me. Um, you want to go forward in the 20 minutes to stop and stop? Want to stop now with the place to stop? Um, I'm fine out of it. You can go on about 20 minutes with this, or we can just say it's, it's a good breaking point. It's up next week. Um, any, any preferences? Opinions? I think sacrifice is really important, and I'd like to know more about it. So I think it's over next week. But that's just me. I need to waste my time. Right. Because it's going to be in the back. I can't watch that. Yeah, no, we're not going to finish. We can start. Uh, you, you, so the question is, you want to start it or just say, let's just wait until next week and then we have more time? Start it? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Y'all being so. Uh, <laughs> a minute. Uh, okay. Show of hands, who would like to walk? <laughs> oh, yeah, we can't continue this if we can't drive into the sun. <laughs> so, so the next you'd like to go on. Who would like to continue on our 15 20 minutes? I have to try. Who would like to wait next week? I think most of them would be next week. Okay. So wait next week then. Alright. Let's That's right. <laughs> Questions, comments? Push those tomatoes for the <laughs> As to the confusion that appears to most of the other people, I am I'm an observer of the human animal, and I see that we need to, if we could, somehow back up a little and start at the front. There's a TV camera up here, and here's what I see. I see people coming from this side of the church to the center, and this side of the church to the center, all in good order, and they look like this, and that's where the confusion starts. You're talking about the ultra rap. Yes, I am. Okay. And maybe that somehow people need to be instructed, those who don't understand, that you are going to start over here. And you're going to go across here and say, logically, you that are going over here will go to the far side, and these people will go to the center of the road. And they don't want like it. They seem to pick a spot that they want to be, and that's where they go instead of going in order. If you're coming from this way and this way, you're bumping into problems along the way that they don't know so far right for that. Get over to this side. And when they're through, these guys should be getting out of there first because they went in there first. And by this, but that doesn't have to be. Some people are doing extra little goodies. I don't know if it's prayers or what it is. Hopefully it's prayers. <laughs> Um, 
in my opinion, one of the advantages of, of a rail is if someone wants to pray for a minute or a second or two, they can. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I don't think it's a I don't think it's a bad thing to be able to pause for a minute. Um, now if you're pausing there for ten minutes, you know, there's an issue. Uh, but they have a pause, so, so, it's, so it's not just receiving a need and receiving a need. Well, let me explain to you my yeah. opinion yeah, of what the good looks like from the outside. Sure. And that's it. Okay. And it don't matter if they're old because when they get up, they're going to go out there anyway and around and back in, which all that looks good. The system, there's nothing wrong with the layout. It's the folks that won't deal with right away or get out of the way. <laughs> I don't know how you bother to teach them that if I write because they see you don't want it. No one else is in the position to do that, so I'm not the one here. Well, that's part of it. It's a two if it's not a problem. Leaving is not a problem. They all leave this way and they get back in the street. I think you're running just as many problems, though. I, I, I think the problem with that system of saying, come in this way and leave this way. So I think that unfortunately, the people are thinking about that as opposed to that. Yeah. Uh, you want people to be able to receive orally, but well. I knew I should keep my mouth shut. That's <laughs> <laughs> not I see the problem, and I'm advising you guys of what it is, but if you don't believe me, stand back and look at it sometimes. All right. I never even noticed it. It's so weird. I think that is. Well, I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. So we need a class on how to use the Sometimes I sit back here because I cough and sneeze so much. Okay. And then I get really confused. About. <laughs> I go I, I in, you know, whatever side I come from. Well, the nice thing when you come back with somebody yeah. out of mm -hmm. you, you can well, just go good. to the row behind and you don't have to yeah. ask them to move or anything. It's just yeah. enough. I mean, you just, whatever's most polite. You know? Yeah, I mean, if, if you were to go to Italy or to Spain or France, mm -hmm. there's no lot. Uh, we're, we're used to lines being a particular way. Uh, we're not as bad as British are. <laughs> uh, everything is a line in order, and you, you just go and stand up in front of a sign for line behind you. Um, but if you look at like, France or Italy, for example, there are no lines. Whenever they're ready, they're not. They'll push you out of the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I think the part of it is just, I think part of it is, is just, our cultural expectations of there being an order which we go and to leave, and there's not really. It's just, I mean, if you want to wait for the last to receive, great. Uh, I'm going to shut the whole lady out of the way to take over first. But, uh, unless you're going to lay, in which case, go for it. I didn't say you were going to lay, but if you were to lay, I'm
I give reverence to the cross. I take a minute, and then people are running me over. Right. And that's the conveyor line. It right. doesn't give you enough time. Even if you stop and bow, stop, yeah. you just bow your head before you take a minute. Right. People are still <laughs> like, and that's where the, the rail helps. by the love of Jesus and the Eucharist. Let us not simply know him in our heads, but love him in our hearts. Adore him here on earth, and live with him in heaven. May all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.